Hi, this is Wes Simpson, founder of LearnIPVideo.com and also the host for the Ames Alliance for IP Media Solutions IP Showcase here at NAB New York. With me right now is Robert Erickson of Grass Valley. And Robert, why don't you tell us what you do for Grass Valley? Hello. Um, thank you, Wes. Thank you for, uh, for hosting this. Thank you for taking the time. Um, My pleasure. This. Um, but I'm Robert Erickson. Um, the strategic account manager for Grass Valley, but I focus on uh, sports and venues, um, which is really quite a dynamic time right now, as any and all of you can imagine, because sports and venues is one of the most challenging parts of our industry today. Um, it's also an area where we're seeing some of the most innovative use of new technology uh, in our industry. So for me to be in this role at this time has really been quite the up and down uh, journey because obviously down because of sports and, and, and venue industry is just getting killed right now, but on the up because it's fantastic working with engineers to see how innovative they're getting and these kind of new solutions they're using and finding new workflows for new technology. So that part of it has actually been really quite exciting. It's almost like they pressed a reset button and you had to redo the, the way you conceived the sports coverage, I guess. You know, you're right when you talk about things like a reset button because that's what we've had to do. You know, this, this industry and, and technology in, it, in and of itself has always had this thing of, well, this is how we're going to do it because this is how we've always done it. And there's, you know, a lot to that approach. When you have high value content with high value assets and commercials playing, you need to take a conservative approach because you can't fail. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that mentality is, can kind of keep you back from innovation and creating new workflows. So there has been a reset button because we just can't do it the way we've been doing it. Um, the last six to eight months. Yep. So there's been this amazing uh, influx of new ideas and new workflows because we have new technologies. You know, we have devices like cameras and switchers and stuff that are native IP that customers were traditionally kind of treating it the way they always have in the SDI world. So we've seen a lot of customers come up with new workflows um, for new solutions because we've had to. Mm -hmm. And the great part is, is we've seen the innovation, but we've also seen the innovation properly applied, where it's not just, hey, we've never done this before. Let's do it and see if it sticks to the wall. Well, you can't do that for a college football game or for an NBA game. It's, hey, we have this new idea. Let's spend the time and the money to evolve it, to mature it, and then let's take it to market and do it. But we've been doing that in a month instead of in three years. Uh -huh. So, yeah, you're right. We have hit a reset button but I think it's really opened up a lot of new workflows that our industry hasn't done in the past that we kind of needed to do anyway. Yeah. So one of the things that, that really hasn't um, been as uh, dynamic in terms of the connectivity uh, for the past decade or so has been the, uh, the, the actual camera. Uh, there's mm -hmm. always been a, a camera connected using a, a SMPTE fiber fiber to a CCU and yes. um, that's really going to be changing now, isn't it? It is. Um, looking at it from a pure engineering standpoint, cameras are challenging mm -hmm. uh, because aside from you know taking in the photons, hitting the sensor, creating it to to electrons, there's a ton of data that we don't use in broadcast. You know, we talk about like four 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 type color sampling and, and you know sixteen bit and things along those lines. It's stuff that cameras can do, but obviously broadcast with their limitations of 10 bit and SDI has just been an awful limitation because oh. you're very fixed in bandwidth. You're very fixed in the physical interface. Um, so there hasn't been much we can do with it. Also, because of all the process that we have to do to fit it in SDI and to do all our traditional stuff, like we have to do traditionally a black burst connector. Oh. You know, it physically has to plug into a camera or you know, our intercom has always traditionally been a two wire or four wire interface that we physically have to plug into the camera. So there's been a lot of, I would say headwinds in the camera industry because we had a physical interface we had to deal with. We had a lot of processing power that had to deal with in the camera that we basically just had to use a base station or an external device to handle all the physical connections and all the external processing and things like that. It's only really been um, about five years now, you know, Grass Valley came out with an IP camera, uh, native out of the camera about five years ago. Mm -hmm. But even at that point, we still had to do some processing in the base station um, because that's what FPGAs at the time allow us to do. And, and, you know, we just couldn't fit that much stuff into the camera head and things like that. It's just been in the last year where technology has allowed us 
to create hardware devices where everything can come out of the camera head as needed. But more importantly, the SMPTE standards, you know, SMPTE 2110-10 for, you know, reference, you know, I can no longer, or SMPTE 2059, if somebody really wants to, to get technical, <laughs> you know, if my camera is a thousand miles away and I want to reference it, I just plug it into a network that has PTP on it and I'm good to go. I no longer have to chase down a Blackburst connector, which mm-hmm. is fantastic for doing remote productions. Sure, that or makes intercom. a lot of sense. Yeah. And then intercom, 2110-30. Uh, and then maybe you throw in some uh, um, uh, AMO ISO 7 for some messaging and tally and that kind of stuff. Stuff that we traditionally had to do very physical interfaces with, we now can truly um, I don't want to say virtualize, it's not the right word, but we can actually truly just create, cr- treat in the pure Ethernet or oh. Ether, there we go, um, there go. Uh, realm because we've removed the need for the physical interface. So it's, we're at this perfect inflection point of technology can do it, the standards allow us to do it, and the customers have the willingness to make the jump that we can finally start really kind of creating um, new cameras and technology platforms that can leverage all three of them together. That's great. So, so let, let's talk about how all these. So what this is, is I know that I have a Grass Valley logo in the bottom right, just because they pay my bills and I like to feed my family. Nothing wrong but with that. This, the slide itself is actually very abstract because we are showing how the cameras will look right now, like as in immediately now and in the future. We could not have done this a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the first things I want to point out, there's no base station for the camera. Really? No CCU, no nothing, huh? No CCU, no nothing. If you have enough power that you can put in the camera head, where the camera head can create its own 2110-20 streams, dash 30, dash 40, and then also handle all the command and control stuff like MWA ISO 4 and ISO 5 and Fratali 07, well, what's the need for a base station? Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's, again, this is the future of, of the look of how cameras look, can look right now and moving into the future. There is some realities we'll talk about in some uh, later in, I think it'd be good to address about supporting legacy cameras. Um, But as we move forward, this is how it's gonna look. So you notice the cameras are plugged directly into a COT switch. The camera control, um, this uh, units are just running off of a COT switch. They have the ability, it's, you know, all this stuff is gonna be a layer three routing. So when you plug the camera in and you plug the camera control in, assuming the network is in some sort of sane state, or if the network is, is adhering to maybe JTNM TR1001 full stack. Oh, that would be nice. That would be nice, right? If they yeah. were, you plug them in, they get their IP addresses, they find each other and they just work. Mm-hmm. That's the future of it. So, um, so am, am I reading this right? Are those CCUs running over PoE so they don't really even need any special cabling or anything? Yeah, that's, you know, this is something that Grass Valley's done because we think that we want to get to converged networks. We want to get to simplify networks and having all sorts of different power injectors and having, you know, power supplies and stuff. It's not what we need anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the option is available on ours. Uh, I would foresee other vendors being able to do that in the future. Um, and okay. that's the goal for it. So the next step is, is, I can't, I don't think we can have any discussion now without talking about a WAN application or a remote application. Absolutely not. Um, so again, this is, this is the vision of, of the future, I would say on this one, is having a camera control server, something that can serve up an HTML5 interface to a computer or even like a dedicated app. Uh, we went down an, an iPad route, um, but again, there's other all sorts of options there. Um, that will allow people to control their cameras remotely status their cameras remotely and, you know, do the camera shading and things like that. Because once everything's IP, you know, we kind of addressed that at the beginning. Once everything's IP, we've removed the physical interface from the equation. So why does the camera shader have to be in the same truck as the camera or in the same building as the camera? Why can't the camera shader be 500 miles away or 1,000 miles away? There's some other considerations we have to, to look at, but in terms of workflows, there's no reason we just can't open up that can of worms. So what about, um, you know, what kinds of information does the, does the shader get? I mean, they're, they're going to need, um, obviously, a way to, to look at the video. Um, they're going to need a way to understand what the camera is doing right now. How, how does all that play into this scenario? That's the toughest part. You know, the actual looking at the parameters or the parametric values of the camera isn't much data. We're just talking about a stream of kilobits of data. 
because uh -huh. uh, that's just hex code that our camera control unit decodes and puts in some sort of human identifiable manner. Um, hands down, the hardest part is how do you get the video to the camera shader? You know, if they're if they're on the same 2110-20 network, that one's pretty easy because they're on the same network. You know, the latency is low. Um, just from a, some experience, and this is getting in the weeds, but there's a design engineer somewhere that'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said that. Uh, we have experienced that when you deal with QC stations on IP cameras, it's best for that, Q, that the QC station to be a make before break destination. Because um, one thing we've found is camera shaders want to sit there and just go through, you know, push the, push the joysticks and go through a bunch of cameras really quick to shade them. And if you don't do it make before break, um, the video will break up for a couple of frames. So every time you change cameras, the video breaks, definitely wait for it to come back and so forth. Um, so by the way, just a small design consideration. I know I went down kind of a, a rat hole on that one, but for any engineer that's looking at it, make before break for camera shading, saves you a ton of pain in the future. Oh, I believe that. Yeah, that, that I could I could absolutely appreciate. It. I always believed in make before break. It's just a matter of you know making sure you have a big enough pipe feeding your display. Exactly. And yeah. for something that's as you know, as important as camera shading, uh, we've had zero pushback. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. well, yes, we'll be glad to go from a ten gig SFP to a twenty five gig SFP because it costs us one hundred dollars. That's the end. Of, you know, that's the end of the discussion usually. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So that, that's an important part, but uh, that's the main consideration is how do you get the video to the camera shader? Now, again, once you're on the, on the local network, you're fine. But once you start talking uh, remote camera shading and things like that, that's when the discussion gets interesting because you have to balance codec and latency. You know, am, am I okay having 120 milliseconds of delay from when I hit a camera control unit button to when I see it on my screen? Maybe. Am I okay with 500 milliseconds? You know, if you're okay with 500 milliseconds, now you can use some pretty heavyweight compression like H.264 and 30 to one compression ratios and stuff. But if you're saying, oh, I can only do, you know, 60 milliseconds or 120 milliseconds, you know, that, then now we're talking different kind of codecs and things like that. So you nailed it on that one where when you're controlling cameras remotely is how do you get that image back to the person doing the remote camera shading? Um, and the last thing you got to watch out for, especially on camera shading, is when you want the camera shaded signal to be pristine, do you really want to go through a really heavyweight codec? Right. Yeah, you know, that's or, a very good question. Yep. If you're going to 420 to shade a camera, are you really, you know, going to be doing the best the best you possibly can for that? So again, there's a lot of design discussions that, that have to be along those lines. And as we kind of talked about at the beginning, we're starting to have those discussions now. Six months ago, nobody cared because they weren't really too worried about it. Now mm -hmm. everybody cares and everybody's talking about it. <laughs> so so ju just out of curiosity, where, where does the uh, camera control server need to be located? It, does that have to be close to the cameras or can that be you know basically anywhere you want virtually? It's all on a network. And again, this is, this is the discussions I love to have is as long as you have a function of bandwidth between your edge device and the network switch, we don't necessarily care where the edge device is. You know, the longer the distance, the potentially higher, higher the latency. Um, so as long as you keep the latency in mind, you know, if your cameras are in Los Angeles and your camera control servers in Hong Kong, but you're shading in Los Angeles, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. But, right, right. you know, just with some, you know, qualified with a bit of sanity, it can really go wherever you want, as long as you have a function of bandwidth and routing between the edge device and the network. All right. Cool. Cool. So, so let's talk about how the signals get in and out of the cameras. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, actually, it cheese up my next slide really well. Um, so what changes here is you put IP in a camera, great. If I just had IP in my camera and I slapped a SFP plus 25 gig SFP in the back of the camera and I handed it to a cameraman, it would take approximately seven seconds for the fiber to be ripped out of the camera and the SFP to be smashed on the bottom of the ground. <laughs> No, you know, <laughs> it's the it's the nature of cameras is that we, we put the cameras close to the action. Therefore, they sometimes unfortunately become part of the action. Right. Um, also, our customers have existing Simpty Fiber installations all around the world. Uh, and Simpty Fiber isn't just about the signal, uh, by the way, as, as in primarily as a broadcast engineer, I tend to care about the transport 
the most, sometimes forgetting about the basics of how do you power the body camera? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, how do we get electrons into it so I can get electrons out of it? Right. I tend to forget about that. So having these existing SMPT fiber installations is great, especially if we can leverage them. So what you're starting to see some vendors do is the cameras have SFPs in the camera head themselves. And then what we do is using some optical couplers and stuff inside the camera and some muxing, we're able to get that signal, the, the SFP or QSFP or SFP plus, I, I don't want to say it's limited to one, out of the camera and inject it into just a standard SMPT fiber. Um, so now we can start using power to power the camera down that SMPT fiber, and then we'll use the fibers in that SMPT fiber to put the IP signals there. And then at some point down the chain, now it could be 20 meters or mm -hmm. based on the slide, you know, it could be three kilometers. We break that fiber out and then we, you're able to plug it into a cot switch. Right. That's the goal. And so you have to have a power injector again to power the camera. So we've seen it from multiple vendors uh, where they have a device that has simply fiber out. It has power in, um, it has fiber in. And then it kind of breaks it all out from the SMPT fiber into your switch, powers the camera, and it goes down to SMPT fiber. So the goal is, and what's been um, been done, and we will see this probably across the, the industry, is we're going to still standardize on SMPT fiber. No need to, re to, to kind of recreate that interface because we it's already there. You know, if, if we went out to a whole bunch of uh, venues and said, hey, you know that <laughs> Two point three million dollars you just spent putting SMPTE fiber in your entire facility. We got a new standard now. We would never be allowed there again. Yeah, that wouldn't so, that wouldn't go over too well. No, I can no. imagine. So, how can we use the technology they already have? How can we use the infrastructure they already have, but still leverage IP? That's been the goal, um, and that'll be always be the same. Even on a studio camera, which is still in a in a protected network, mm -hmm. you never know if the robot's going to back over a cable or if sure. the stage manager is going to step on a cable or anything like that. You're always you still always want to have a an armored armored and protected connector. So stigma simply fiber just seems to be the best way of doing that. So let, let's talk about the, the signals going in and out of the camera and you know how they interface with the switch. So uh, this is a pretty simple one. I'm just talking about a single camera running a single stream. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, it's UHD. Uh, SMPTE and AMWA has been fantastic um, at giving us the tool sets we need. So now the, the video leaving the camera, SMPTE 2110-20, the video coming here, the return video is SMPTE 2110-20. Uh, there's some other stuff and we can talk about a little bit later, like SMPTE 2110-22 and 23 for compressed and high frame rate. Well, that's some other stuff mm -hmm. to talk about. But now you look at audio, um, you know, for the ISO mic on the camera, well, it's 2110-30 coming out of the camera. Uh, your intercom, instead of a, uh, two wire or four wire connector is now just a, another 2110-30 trunk. Um, the C2 IP, uh, that's an unfortunate grass valley vernacular, but that's just your control panel over IP uh, network. So that's something you got to realize too is, you know, if you look at like the JTNM TR1001 stack, mm -hmm. you know, we always talk about how control needs to be in band with the um, media network we take that a step further on cameras because nobody wants to run another ethernet link to the camera just for camera shading. Right. So you want to be able to embed the camera shading controls and that kind of stuff into the media network. So you can do all that, all that over the same IP. Um, and then you notice on this one too, and I love the standard personally, and it's just starting to get adopted is things like ISO seven, you know, how do you do tally? How do you do the concept of state over IP? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure there's a mathematician somewhere that's like, wait, somebody's having a conversation about recording state of a device. You know, that's something that we haven't had to deal with too much. Uh, but I love it as a standard. Um, so, so, so where's timing on this? Am I, am I missing it or is it? No. And that's the part I love about it is, is once we just make 2110 ubiquitous, ubiquitous into the device, you know, one of the fundamentals of 2110 is 2110-10. Mm -hmm. um, which requires the use of PTP or in our case, SMPTE 2059. Right. Uh, so there is no black burst. There is no uh, external reference on this stuff. The idea is, is we want no legacy cabling. We want to be able to have everything from timing to signals, to audio, to 
uh, state changes all to be done over the same media network. And so by using the SMPTE protocols and the SMPTE standards um, in the way that they were intended also, I know I keep on bringing it up full stack, but it, I think it's a, a paramount document for us to, to be referencing. When implemented correctly, gives you this implementation mm -hmm. as intended. And they're also, speaking of things of intended, I have it on the slide just because I like to talk about it. When we talk about signals like uh, UHD, um, we traditionally, myself included, say it's 12 gigabit per second. Or, you know, a 1080p is a three gig signal. I think actually this, this slide references it both correctly and incorrectly on the same slide. Mm -hmm. uh, once we've moved into the SMPTE 2110-20 domain, we're only messing with active video. We're no longer dealing with rasters and things like that. So when you look at a UHD signal at 60 hertz coming over IP, it's actually 11 gigabits per second instead of the 12 gig. And a three gig signal is actually just a little bit above uh, two gigabit of actual real video bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So there is some efficiencies that add up. You know, you look at the slide, you say, well, you've got one camera, I saved one gigabit, who cares? Well, we did a, a deal up in, um, uh, was it Sweden for the World Cup where we had 60 cameras. Well, now by saving one gigabit of video, multiplied by 60 cameras, I saved myself 60 gig, which is a stunning amount of bandwidth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when we think about these installs, you see something, a number like this, I'm saving a gig here, I'm saving a gig there, there. aggregated and scaled over a traditional broadcast network, that becomes a pretty big deal. Cool, cool. So um, so you, you mentioned that you also handle, um, you know, high frame rate and uh, other video formats. And that's something that's really good to, to talk about is um, when you look at camera designs, you need uh -huh. to look at how you interface those designs to the network relative to your bandwidth. Uh -huh. If I'm just doing a single UHD out of a camera, um, I know that I'm just going to need one 25 gig SFP or two, if you want to do SMPTE 2022-7, that's what I'm going to need. Um, but what happens with newer cameras, with newer imagers that can do high frame rate at UHD? Mm -hmm. you know, Grass Valley is by no means the only manufacturer that can do high frame rate at uh, UHD. Um, but since we're one of the first ones, or the first one to do native IP, it became a challenge. Whereas when you look at UHD high frame rate, uh, say we do 3X in, the, in this example, uh, we're looking at 47.2 gigabits per second of data, raw data wow. coming back out of the camera, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's funny to look back. I think my first cable modem I bought, um, you know, 2001 had three megabit. Yeah, that was great. That was the best. <laughs> and now we're starting to throw around data rates like 47.2 gigabits per second um, pretty easily now coming mm -hmm. out of the camera. And that's the reality, especially once we go into higher frame rates of UHD or even 8K, the data rates just get crazy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you also don't want to force somebody to use a hundred gig QSFP, which is what you need for high frame rate and things like that on a 1080i signal. Right. You know, if, if you're just running that camera at 1080i, but all the camera has is a hundred gig QSFP, you're wasting a, a very extensive slot on your switch and about 98 gigabits of potential bandwidth. Right, right, right. So that's a, it's an important design consideration is, is do you use QSFPs or SFPs or SFP pluses, or can you give the opportunity to choose it based on how the camera is going to be used? Mm -hmm, I think that mm -hmm. personally, I think that's really important. Yeah. So let's talk about the, uh, when the, the signals arrive at the, at the, the shader's position, what, what kinds of uh, tools are they going to be looking at? Um, you keep bringing up really good questions about the complexities that are, that are brought out, brought on to the new cameras and new IP. And one of the things that the industry has been going through recently is in an HDR push and a wide color gamut push. Um, and yeah, for anybody big. who it is, and I think, by the way, just for anybody, this is a small pet peeve of mine. I'm just going to, to go on a soapbox for like 10 seconds. Everybody's talking about HDR. Nobody's talking about wide color gamut. <laughs> they are inexplicably tied together. They, right. they, they always go together. When you have one, you, you have the other. Um, so it's a good conversation to have. So when you start talking about things like high frame rate cameras, 
but also things like wide color gamut and um, HDR, you have so much more parameters you have to adjust as a camera operator. Um, and that's another thing I'm like, I'm loving seeing out of the industry right now is from multiple vendors, we're seeing new UIs, new ways of interacting with the cameras. Because when I do an HDR uh, camera shading, I'm not only just worried about iris now, I'm not, not only just worried about gain, but I have knees. Well, with imagers that have the capability of doing potentially 15 stops of dynamic range, I can actually very literally adjust the shadows independently of the highlights. Mm -hmm. I can adjust the midtones independent of the shadows. I can adjust the red in the midtone independent of the red in the shadows. <coughs> there are so many hooks now. There's so many parametric values that need to be accessed to really make white color gamut and HDR stand out that mm -hmm. we as an industry have to improve our user interfaces. And we're starting to see some new ones come out. Um, again, this is, this is just one of our examples, but I think it's something that, that needs to be very high on the conversation because what's the point of having a very high quality camera that can give you, you know, expanded capabilities and dynamic ranges and better colors, you know, especially with Rec 2020 and things like that, but you can't control it or it's mm -hmm. difficult to control. You know, if um, I love to use the example of uh, sunset during an outdoor baseball game, you know, every couple of minutes or every couple of seconds as the sun sets and the shadows get longer on the field, you have to continuously tweak all of the cameras as you go. Well, if you're having 26 cameras and you're having to tweak all of the levels across all those cameras all the time, you see where it becomes um, a very heavy uh, duty to do. So how can we create better user interfaces? And this is for the customers to come back. How can we maybe share the workload? Mm -hmm. Do you necessarily have to hammer on one or two camera shaders at the local facility? Maybe you can share the workload to multiple people who are remote mm -hmm. or maybe multiple people locally, you know, however you want to do that. So, so it sounds like the camera shader job is getting more uh, complex, a little bit, maybe a little bit more artistic than it has been in the past. I don't know. Maybe that's not fair, but. No, I, I absolutely think it is. Um, you know, and I like the, 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 the phrasing of artistic you used. Our cameras in the broadcast space over the past couple of years have been severely limited by our interfaces. Mm -hmm. You know, a 10 bit 422 interface with Rec 709 colors and things like that. There wasn't much we can do to really tune up the image. Mm -hmm. But now that we have Rec 2020 and we have HDR and we have, you know, significantly more bandwidth to, to be able to do this kind of stuff, there's no reason that we can't elevate the quality of image that we're using in our productions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you say artistic, I think cinematic. Uh, I think that there is no reason that we can't add more drama to our productions simply by adjusting the camera, the camera shading, adjusting the colors the cameras are using, the, the uh, contrast that the camera is using, things on those lines. So you're right. These are tools that we have to make it more artistic and really give some punch to the content. But the onus comes now to the camera shader. Mm -hmm. And I think the camera shaders will love it. I mean, these guys are golden eyes. They spend their life learning to be the best at what they do. We're just giving them better tools now to do it. And mm -hmm. that's what the industry is looking, is, is looking forward to also, I believe. So, so just one, one final question. When are we going to get to the point where everything that we see is going to be HDR? Is that, is that um, just a very short time away? Or do you think it's going to be a, a long haul before we get there? Funny you bring it up, because if you asked me that question a year ago, I'd have been saying, yeah, we're a ways away. Mm -hmm. But just this year, we've seen a lot of changes in the industry that has everything to do with distribution. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the challenge of HDR is, and, and I've seen this, you know, I've been in trucks for the past five or six years watching a show in 1080p HLG or 1080p PQ and sitting in the truck and saying, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And the only people that can see it are the 50 people in the truck, right? You know, by the time it hits home, you're already squashed down to 420. Somebody threw a five megabit compressor in there somewhere and it just looks like garbage. Right. So with streaming platforms becoming extremely popular the past six or eight months, that really takes the gloves off on how do we get content to the, to the home, to the end user where they can see it in HDR and in white color gamut. 
But I also think seeing the sex, success of things like um, the ATSC3 mm -hmm. and the ability for us to, to be able to get that content home even over the air. Um, we've seen a lot of pr progression on, HT, uh, on that this year. Uh, we've mm -hmm. seen a lot of great demos doing that this year. Um, and then also having higher data rates to the home, whether it's, you know, whether it docks this on your cable modem, whether it's fiber or whether even if you're using uh, some of the new uh, cell phone technologies, a lot of the traditional reasons that we couldn't get HDR and white color gamut to the home are going away right now. And mm -hmm. the best part is, is they're actually happening. You know, we're no longer talking about it. We're no longer saying it's going to be a year or two or three. The reality is, is we can do it now. We can probably hit 80 to 90% of the United States today if we wanted to and get that, that expanded image home. It just depends on if the people at home even know about it. And that's <laughs> something that's something I don't know how much us on this side of the industry. Well, can do. I, I, th I think once people see it, they're going to like it, but, but it's, it's a matter of seeing it. So, yep. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to have to get a new TV now. It sounds like, but <laughs> you you know, the, the funny thing is, is I'm still running an 11 year old LG at my house and considering what I do for a living, you know, I kind of look down on myself for it, but um, I agree. Well, you don't, you, you don't spend enough time at home to, to make it uh a necessity yeah no nope. maybe that'll change in the next few years we'll see exactly <laughs> robert thank you very much for your time um very very informative and i think that um you know people need to understand that that cameras really are you know 100 percent native ip we don't have to uh use a lot of the uh, the infrastructure that's there before and there's a lot of choices that are available now and that are coming on the market very very rapidly so we can literally be you know, ST2110 from the sensor all the way into the production facility. We don't, we don't need to have all these uh, adapters and converters and all that stuff along the way. You're absolutely right. And it's, we're finally there, you know, especially on the cameras, it's such a tough technology to get through to do, but we're there. Um, if, if I do have one last thing I can kind of maybe ask for the larger audience though, is we are seeing now that we have IP endpoints becoming prevalent that the training for the engineers hasn't necessarily kept up. Mm -hmm. So if, if there is an ask that I have for anybody on the audience, especially if you are a broadcast engineer or a manager of broadcast engineers or a department of one, is the training, the understanding of the engineers to know how this technology works is so key. It's a, it's a smaller group right now. It needs to get larger, you know, because mm -hmm. what we love is to have a larger group of people that really understand how 2110 enabled devices can change our, our workflow and how it can change um, what we consider a broadcast environment. And the more people that understand the technology, the better the industry is going to be because we'll all work together collaboratively. You know, we have events like this that, that we're doing mm -hmm. right now that allow us to do this. Um, so my ask for anybody is if you want to learn more about it, ask somebody in the industry. Um, you know, I can speak for myself, but I can also probably guarantee you that every vendor in this industry will agree. If you want to learn more about the technology, ask us. We are glad to send you something, mm -hmm. whether it's a gateway card or a camera or a network switch or an SDN. Again, this isn't just coming from my company side, but from the, the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. The more the devices we get out to people, the more people learn about them, the more people say, Hey, this is great. Oh, hey, I broke this technology. Maybe we can change something. You know, the more we can get to get people trained and used to the technology, the more ideas and the better it's going to get. So if there's one ask that I have, since I have a bit of a, a soapbox to stand on for a second, that would be it. Well, great. Yeah. I mean, that that's one of the reasons I formed this new company is to really try to get, you know, people to, to learn more about IP video. So hopefully uh, I'll be able to keep up with uh, some of the demand. Let's, let's see what happens. I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Robert. I uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, in person at, a, at an upcoming event, or at least virtually. So Very much. Looking for impersonal things again. All right. Thank you.